All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Brad Berzer, and uh, I assume that for most of you, this is either your first or second class here at Hillsdale. So this, this course that, we're, that I'm teaching is really the core of the core. So you have your, your core hours that you have to take over the four years that you're here. This is the introduction to the core. And so a lot of what we're gonna do in here, it's not quite a history class, it's why we call it a heritage class. We're really gonna be talking a lot about ideas and how ideas really play themselves out in certain cultures and how they will advance from one culture to another culture. Sometimes they're dropped, sometimes they're modified, sometimes they're accepted, but that's what our heritage is. And so we're trying to figure out in this course, not only what is the West, as we're thinking about Western civilization, but we're trying to figure out what the West means as we move forward in history, and again, both discard and add on new things. So uh, a huge part of your, your course is this book. And this is really this book that you guys all have a, a copy of. Sorry, I have to put a tile on I don't know if you guys know what those are. That way I can find it when it's uh, <laughs> with all my kids and everything. But anyway, um, this book is really going to be the, the most important thing you have in this class. So you also have that textbook that you're going to be using as well. And if you look on the back of the syllabus that I gave you, I have a list of terms that I want you to know from that textbook. So the textbook's important, but it's really, I'm not going, I'm going to assign it right now, and then we're probably not going to talk much about it for the rest of the semester. I'm just going to assume that when we're talking, for example, about the ancient Hebrews, you're reading about Near East culture. When we get to the, the Greeks, you're reading about the Greeks. When we get to the Romans, you're reading about the Romans and so forth. So I hope that, that this, what I call a term chaser, I have these in the order in which they appear in the text itself. So you know, if you're looking for civilization, it's gonna show up pretty quickly and then keep reading until you find patriarchy and know what those terms are. So those will be important for your midterms uh, as well as, as for your final. And you can see I mean, there are a couple of things in here that we just don't have time to talk about. Like right in the middle, uh, we've got Muhammad, the Quran, Sunni, Shia. You know, it, very important that you understand what Islam is. It's just not something that we're gonna be dealing with directly, but you still need to know it in the background of things and what's going on, especially when we talk about someone like Thomas Aquinas. There's no way to talk about Aquinas without talking about Islam, uh, at least in the background. So I would ask that you keep reading, and you know, you're welcome to read with each other you can create small groups. Uh, you can do whatever you'd like. If some of you want to take on chapter one and outline it and give it to everybody else and someone else wants to do chapter two, that's totally fine. You can work with each other in any way you want. But I do want to make sure that you are reading in the background. But this is really the main book that I want you to be focused on. So I'd like for you all, whenever you come to my office for office hours and you need to talk to me, bring your book. Sometimes I might just ask to look at it. I like to see what you're doing with it. Uh, always bring it to class. There's really no sense in having class. If you don't have your book, we'll be referring to it every single class this semester. So you need to carry it with you. And it's one of those books that as a core book, we actually hope, because you can't sell it back, it's one reason we hand it out to you so every new student class gets them. Uh, we hope that you'll keep it your whole four years and it will remain one of your core texts during your four years at Hillsdale. So. We're going to start in it in just a little bit, but I would really like for you, and I know that when you were in, in high school, especially if you went to public high school, you were not allowed to, to write in your books. Uh, that is exactly the opposite here. I want you to write like mad in your books. Uh, as you're, you're reading the documents that we have, and the documents can be very difficult. Uh, believe me, the first time you've ever read a Socratic dialogue uh, that Plato has written in which they're talking about the nature of justice and so forth, these are very complicated things. And I want you to wrestle with those in your book. So I, mine's gotten a little crazy because it's been, I've had it for several years now. But I'd like you to, to be able to mark it, use marginalia. You know, it's one thing if you've got a yellow highlighter and you highlight a whole bunch of stuff. But that's, that's fine as long as you have a marker next to it explaining what all that glob was. Otherwise, when you get to a midterm, you're just going to have a lot of highlighted stuff that doesn't mean anything. So make sure that you, you're actually writing, working in the margins, trying to figure out what the argument is, and wrestle with the authors uh, in a good way and a bad way. That is, you know, wrestle, figure, figure out what they're trying to say, 
but also if you disagree with them or you have questions, question them. And we can do that in class as well. And it's one of the things we will be doing is thinking about what these authors are trying to do throughout the entire semester. So keep this book and keep it, I hate to say sacred, because that maybe is a little overblown, but it's not totally overblown, not for this class. And true for everybody, take, every one of you uh, in your incoming class who has to take it, uh, all of you have to take it. So on the syllabus, if you look over it quickly, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but if we look at the syllabus, we have uh, the reader, which I just provided for you, the secondary text, which the bookstore should have, and hopefully at a, a, I don't know what the price is, I hope it's reasonable. Um, I'm going to assume that it's reasonable. We asked for the value edition, so I, I assume that means it's printed on cheaper paper with black and white photos instead of color photos, but anyway, I, I, uh, I don't know. So hopefully that's, uh, my copy is supposed to arrive, I think, tomorrow. Uh, and then we, I have a book uh, that I also need you to have, which we'll talk about not today, but probably in a couple of classes, and that's your Kate Turabian. She was the secretary at the University of Chicago's history department back in the 20s or 30s, I think a century ago. Uh, and she put together this manual on writing, and that's what everybody here in the history and the English department uses. So if you have a copy of Turabian, you're gonna need that your whole four years that you're here at Hillsdale, but certainly you're gonna need it for your first two years without question. Yeah. Does it need to be the ninth edition? It does, yeah. So we've all gone to the ninth edition. Um, and I know there are lots of older editions floating around, so I'm sorry about that, but yeah, it's, it's definitely the ninth that we're gonna be using. So isn't that the one that they had? Yeah, it was on the booster. Yeah, good, okay. Because somebody in the department told me we're on the 10th edition, and I was like, oh no, I don't think so. So anyway, I wanted to make sure we're still on the night. I've been, I've been on sabbatical for a year, so this is, uh, I haven't been in the classroom since early March of 2020 because of COVID, so you guys have to forgive me if I'm a little slow on some of these things. Uh, but yeah, it, it should be the ninth. so. Okay, and then I'll have miscellaneous handouts that I'll probably just email to you. Uh, various things like the significance of St. Augustine, the significance of Aquinas, various things that I put together just as study aids for you that uh, hopefully will help as well. And I'm, I've been teaching this course now for it's my 21st year, so um, a lot of things have accumulated over that time. In terms of grading, I would like for all of you, of course, to be here as much as you can. I, mean, I don't have uh, an attendance policy. If you need to miss, you need to miss. That's uh, uh, frankly, none of my business if you're going to miss. Uh, but try not to miss more than once or twice during the year. And, and do keep in mind, especially now, that there's a good chance that you might get the flu or something. So you might want to think about reserving those few times that you miss for the chance that you get sick during the semester. But you know, there's, if you have, for example, uh, you're taking Latin right after this course, and so you have an 11 o'clock Latin exam one day, I wouldn't blame you if you didn't come to this class because you needed to study for your Latin exam. Uh, I would rather you do both, come to class and do well on your Latin exam, but I also totally, I know, they're just times you just can't always make it. But do try and come as much as you can because we're really, you'll see this it won't necessarily happen today or tomorrow or even over the next month, but over the next two months, we'll really form a community. It's just we're going to get to know each other very, very well. And you're all going to get to know each other. You're going to get to know each other because we're going to be talking about these ideas so much. And there's going to be so much conversation in here that, that you'll really get to understand one another. So what I do have is a participation grade. And what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you have to ask a lot of questions during the semester. Some people are naturally shy. Others are precarious. I know how that works. And uh, I'm totally fine with that. Some, some people learn best by just listening. Um, not that, And that's not a problem. But... After having taught so long, I can really tell when you're paying attention to the course and when you're not. I think students often think that teachers aren't paying attention to that, but it's just second nature to me to know who's into this and who's not. And that means that you bring your book. It means that you follow along. It means that you're interested when other people are doing readings and so forth in, co in the course. So it's only 15% of your grade. It's the smallest percentage we have in here. But still, uh, it's important, and it can make a difference between, say, an A minus and a B plus at the end of the semester. So, so do you know, bring your best to the class uh, every time, please. Plus, it makes the class so much more interesting. 
I, it's just if you're into it, um, believe me, it's so much more interesting for all of us. Okay, and then uh, you have three papers in here, and this is part of my job as a core professor. So all of your core courses will assign a certain number of papers. You have three in here, and I have already given you the topics. If you can see there under papers, paper one, paper two, paper three, you are welcome to start working on those anytime you want. I think it would be best for you to start doing the, the first one first because you know where we're at and it's gonna make the most sense over the next several classes. But I have the paper dates due. So the first paper date is due September 17th. And I don't have it due in class. You just turn it into my office. My office is Delp 403. So you just bring it up by five o'clock on that Friday and put it in the box outside of my office door. So Delp 403, I think, did I put that? I didn't put that on the syllabus. Yeah, I should write that down. So Delp is uh, this building right here. And I'm up on the, in fact, you can even I'm sure see my office. I'm up in this top corner right there. So, 44403. Sorry about that, not putting that on the syllabus. And I also, I didn't put on, and this, this was intentional. I, in fact, I had it on and I took it off about a half hour ago when I was printing these. I took off my office hours uh, because I'm not sure what I'm going to have them as yet. I know that I will have office hours every Tuesday and Thursday from 2.30 to 3.45, but I'm not sure what they'll be for Monday, Wednesday, Fridays yet. So I, I've still got to figure that out, but I'll, I'll definitely let you know as soon as I have that figured out. And I encourage you, you know, come see me. Uh, uh, let me know how things are going. If you have specific questions about papers or whatever it may be, something in class, you know, do don't hesitate to come see me during office hours. That's what that's what we're there we're there for. So uh, please come on up. Okay, so your papers, you'll have three of them throughout the class. Uh, I will try and get those back to you, you know, as very soon as possible after you get them to me. Sometimes I can get them back to you the following Monday, uh, but not always. It just kind of depends what my schedule's like at that time, but I will try and get them right back to you. And I'll talk about what I really want in a paper coming up in a couple of classes, what I'm looking for in a paper. You have two midterms, and I know that seems weird, but we break the class down into three parts. So you have the first third, second third, and then the third third. And for each one of those, you have a test. So midterm, midterm, and then your final. And your final will be cumulative, though it'll focus mostly on the last last part. And the midterms will focus on the part. So midterm two will still be cumulative, but it'll focus on the third right before it. Okay, I think that should be it. Anybody have questions? Yeah, tell me, and when you ask questions, especially for the first three weeks or so, tell me your names right away, because I, I want to learn them. So, I'm Sam. What is it? Sam. Sam, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, so for midterms and the finals, do you allow our notes that we take or no? Only, only in prepping for the exam, not actually during the exam. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, no open notes. Um, sometimes on the final, depending on how the semester's go, gone, I'll let you look in your book for five minutes or something. So, but so, yeah, that's kind of a maddening thing rather than an actual helpful thing. Right. <laughs> so you're desperately flipping through at the last minute. Yeah, but no, uh, just I would encourage you to take as good a notes as possible during the course. And again, you know, feel free to work with other people. Uh, and if you want to share notes and ideas, uh, you can do it as a whole, you can do it in groups, whatever you'd like. Right. So, yeah, thanks. Good. Yes? Uh, my name is Gwen. Gwen. And Yes, and just for future reference, uh, what, how do you feel about taking notes on laptops? You're welcome to as long as you promise not to get on the internet while you're doing it. So as long as you keep it local in here. Yeah, yeah. so whatever on your iPad or your whatever you're taking on is fine. Yeah, yeah. But I would, you're going to, you'll see pretty quickly that the way we do class, I really like you to be focused on the book. So it's okay to have your laptop, but the book is going to be, we're going to be in it so much that it'll be a little hard to transition from one to the other. Not impossible, but hard. So, yeah. Yes? I'm Anna. Anna, thanks. What is the date for the final? I don't know what it is yet. It's not up to me. The college assigns the dates. Uh, and I think they probably already released it, but I was too lazy to look it up and figure out what it is. So I'm sorry. I don't know. But it, it should, I'm, it, if you've got a, they gave you a course schedule booklet. It should be on the, not the blue one, but if they gave you a white 
one, and maybe they didn't because you're freshmen. Um, I'm not sure if they do or not, but it, it's on the front of that. So somebody somewhere should have it. So, but yeah, it's all predetermined. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sam. Um, so when you do figure out when your office hours are, yeah. would you prefer us to email you before we show up or can nope. we show No, you can just come anytime. I mean, there you never know if someone else is going to be there in front of you, but yeah, just come. And, you're, and I'll make it by appointment too. So if there's some time, if my office hours just don't work for you, then we'll, we'll make an appointment and go get a coffee or something. Right. So, yeah, good. Yes? Well, are those office hours going to be in here or are they going to be in your office? They'll be in the office. Right. Yeah, so always DELP 403. Yeah, unless we do it by appointment and meet somewhere else. But yeah, DELP 403. Thanks. Yeah, this is not my classroom. Right? We switch around. So, good. Okay. All right, guys. Well, excellent. Let's get started. Let's uh, jump right into Genesis. And we'll talk a little bit about what this document tells us and what we're trying to get out of this. So, if you remember, we have a, a number of questions that we want to ask in this course. And one of the most important questions that we're going to ask is, what is the West? So what do we mean by this when we talk about the West? It's definitely not popular right now. Uh, in fact, I would say it's extremely unpopular to talk about what Western civilization is because everybody's decrying it at the moment as racist and sexist and imperialist, which Hands all those things, no question. I mean, we are human, and every human society unfortunately embraces to some extent those various things. Uh, so, we're not going to be able to escape that. But I also think that if we had an entire course just about the dreadful parts of society, that uh, we would be pretty depressed at the end of it and really despairing of what could happen. So I don't want to I don't want to sugarcoat any of it, but I also want us to think about realistically what is this and if we can say and we will be able to say this after we read Genesis, if we can say that the human person is both really good and really bad at the same time, which seems to be the historical case of understanding the human person, that we're we're capable of amazing, but unbelievable feats. I mean, just think about. These guys who just went into space because they had the money to do it. Right? That, that's incredible. Right? These things that we're able to do. But then we also make Holocaust camps and we kill six million Jews. Right? That's, that's also part of the Western tradition. That's part of humanity. So we have to kind of figure out, if we're looking at the human person, how do we balance those things? How do we find something that is both the good and the bad? And naturally, any of our civilizations, and Western civilization is one of the two or three great civilizations in world history, it's going to have both as well. And we're not going to escape that. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't just focus on the negative, though. That would be, I mean, can you just, just imagine if your entire life was always defined by the worst thing you ever did in your life? Again, pretty miserable existence, I would think. Not that we shouldn't remember the worst thing we've done in our lives, but we don't make it our guide star, right? It's not what we navigate by, it's what we avoid. So we've got to learn, but we don't just focus on that. I mean, again, what a dreadful existence to do something like that. And so here we have with Western civilization, this, this idea, it is good and bad. And I would argue that the West at its best has always sought to kind of figure out the dignity of the human person and the liberty of the human person. That those two things, at its best, dignity and liberty have been its goals to try and find out how do we understand that and what do we do with that? What does that mean for us in everyday society? So we have this second document in the reader. Anyone want to take a guess why Code of Hammurabi came first in your reader? If you'll open up, Code of Hammurabi starts on page 9. And Genesis starts on page 19. Genesis beginning. <laughs> why, why is that not the, the first document? Anyone would? Yeah, what's your name? I'm Emma. Emma, thanks. Would it be because Hammurabi's code is the first like, written down? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Genesis was an oral tradition for a long, long time. But Hammurabi was actually based on what was written in the stone in the various cities of the kingdom. And so it's our oldest 
document in terms of it being a written document. Genesis should be older, obviously, but it was passed down orally until Moses, as the tradition goes, and then Moses wrote it down. So we have a very long time without it, but I I don't want to start with Hammurabi. I want to start with Genesis. So I guess it's my privilege as a professor, but I want to start where I think the beginning really is. So uh, I'd love it if somebody would read. We'll start right there on page 19. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, a text I'm sure you're all at least vaguely familiar with, some of you probably very familiar with. Yeah. Um, I'm Maggie. Maggie. Mm -hmm. You haven't told me that yet. Sorry. Okay, no, but Maggie and red hair. Yes. That's that's perfect. So I I should be able to remember that. Okay, thank you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the, that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, which according to its kind upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, which is their seed, each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning a third day. Okay, let's stop there, Maggie. Three days is very good. Thank you. Nicely read, by the way. Very nicely read. Let's talk about this for a bit. And yeah, you're welcome to bring in Sunday school or catechism, but that's not really what we're doing here. We're trying to figure out what did an ancient Hebrew think about creation? Right? We're looking at the world through their eyes now. And what do we see? What, what kind of God is this? I mean, there are gods everywhere in the ancient world. You can't walk without stepping on a statue or a shrine. Right? And here we have this God. What, what do we know about this God? What's your name? I'm Rachel. Rachel. Um, so they thought there was just one God who okay. always existed. And Critically God. important. One God, right? Not, not several, not divided into parts, but one God. Okay, and what else? Um, and he created everything out of nothing. Okay, so, right, absolutely. Right? He created everything out of nothing. Which What does that say about him? He's like all powerful. Yeah. He's he is outside of matter and time. He is all-powerful. So th- this is a different kind of God than we've seen. Now, there are other monotheistic cultures. The Jews are not the only monotheistic culture. As we'll see, that many of the Greeks, for example, the Greek philosophers, came down to the idea that there could only be one God because, by very definition, if God is God, you can only have one. You can't have multiple omnipotent beings. That makes no sense. So it's actually reasonable. It's rational to believe that there's only one God. And the the Greek philosophers, not the Greeks, the Greeks had a billion gods, but the Greek philosophers really believed that there was only one God as well. And we know that there was a period in Egyptian history as well where they believed that there was one God, uh, Akhenaten. So uh, there are a couple of different cultures that have this. But most cultures at the time were polytheist, which is funny. In a lot of ways, polytheism can be very tolerant. And that's not always good. Uh, Sometimes that tolerance can create problems in society. But usually if you're polytheistic, it's kind of like, well, I've got my God and you've got your God. Think about what we do now. I've got my opinion, you've got your opinion. (laughs) This stuff circulates in all kinds of ways, and we don't call it polytheism anymore. We call it tolerance. But it's still, it's it's there. And we're going to have to talk about that because... You can imagine how successful a society could be. What, what would the Jews have been if they had been polytheists? They would have gotten nowhere right, at all. So their society is actually dependent upon an intolerance dealing with their God and an understanding of their God. So I want you to think about that. And, and we can, again, like all things, it's good and bad. 
but we, we need to think about what that means for these people. Okay, so it was Rachel, right? Yeah, thank you for that. What's your name? Michaela. Michaela. I was just going to say... Oh, you're, you're, uh, Jolene's you're Jolene's sister. Yes, that's right. I was very excited when I saw you on the list. Thank yeah, you. and I figured... I didn't know you were Jolene's sister, but I figured... We look very similar. Yeah, you guys do, but I, I actually wouldn't have noticed that right away. Oh. So, now that you say it. Anyway, glad to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, I was just going to say what you were talking about. I was saying they believe he's a god of order because whereas other polytheistic polytheistic cultures would have had God of the heavens, God of the earth, right. and that God created everything in a specific order. Yeah, in a specific order. And that, that's actually one of the most important things to understand about this document is that there is an order to all things. And, and so order is one of those interesting words for us. We're going to talk about it all the time in this class. But one of the most important aspects about the West is that we're trying to figure out what its order is. And order is another word for justice. And justice means to give each person his due. It's a definition you have to know in here. Justice means to give each person his or her due. So that is, you recognize, I recognize where Michaela is. And I, I don't mean, I mean, there's actually an order to her sitting right there at the moment from my vantage point and the way I'm looking. But there's also an order to the fact that this is her first or second class at the college, that she's new here, that you all belong to the same order of being first year students with her coming in. You all probably come from about the same time span in terms of your birth. Now, I'm, I'm sure they're outliers, but overall, you're probably all born within about a year of each other. Right? There's an order to that. There's an order to the fact that she's a child, meaning not, I don't mean not an adult. I mean a child of parents, right? You have to take two parents, so do I. We all do. There's an order to that. So justice is knowing our place in the order of existence, and it, it works in different ways. So I'm 53. My order is different than yours. Right? And yet we share the same order of this class, and we share the same order of being at Hillsdale together. So even though I'm three times, well, not yeah, three times your age, yeah, even though that's where I'm at at this point, yet there's still an order that we share, and we'll keep finding that throughout the whole semester. And there's a sense of justice. Right? You will treat me in a certain way simply because I'm the professor, and I will treat you in certain ways certainly simply because you're the student. But I will also get to know you individually, so at some point, Michaela and Maggie will be two very different people in my mind, even though we share the same order. And that, that becomes really important into a, a human, into a flourishing society. And that's part of what we see here with what God is doing. God is extremely ordered. He is not chaotic at all. And when he does chaotic things, like he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, we're shocked. And we should be shocked. That's wild, and yet he can do it. Obviously, he can do it. He's God. He can do whatever he wants, but he doesn't do stuff like that very often. It's pretty rare when we have those kinds of things. But when they happen, they're dramatic. The flood, it's crazy, dramatic, chaotic, and yet he's restoring order and balance to what he's been doing, at least from the belief that comes in that God. So there's always this sense of justice and order. Uh, very important to understand here. In fact, you can you can really mark verses one through five as just order right from the beginning. Right? It's a it's a very important understanding, and then we see that order continue in various things. Okay, what else? And here you know, feel free to to bring in some of your if you have some background in, in catechism or Sunday school, whatever it may be. What what else do we? Yeah, what's your name? Right, yeah, okay. right here with glasses. I'm uh, sorry. I'm Lucy. Lucy. Yes. Great. He puts an essential emphasis on goodness. Okay. It's not necessarily a given in a lot of your really ancient cultures or religions. Okay, okay. talk, talk about that a little bit. So what do you mean by goodness? Um, like, he was feared for the right reasons, I guess. They weren't just afraid of their God because he was... Powerful. I mean, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm totally off here, but I think a lot of religions back then their gods weren't necessarily good. They didn't necessarily mm. fear them for their goodness right. and their 
power combined, but just because they were powerful alone. Yeah, and yet this God is still incredibly powerful, right? right? He defines power. But at the same time, I think this is part of where this order comes from, the justice. There's a goodness because we can trust him, right? There's a goodness. He's not a trickster figure. That, that would be Satan. Satan is clearly the trickster figure in Christianity and, and Judaism. Uh, but he, God is not. God doesn't play games. He'll negotiate every once in a while. And we'll see him. I mean, he, he's actually, he's funny at times. Uh, at times, <laughs> right? Not always. But, you know, when Abraham is told in the next few chapters that his wife, Sarah, is going to have a baby and she's, what, 100, 99, Abraham just starts laughing. I mean, they're ta- he and God are talking together. He just cracks up. It's a, it's a great moment, right? God doesn't laugh, but Abraham does. But God doesn't get mad at that. So, okay. There, there's a real sense there that there is this goodness, and I think that's the trust that you have. Yeah, Sam. Um, yeah, so kind of in a similar way, I think that um, the God and the way that the story is written, it's not so much focused on the human experience but it's more about something larger and the god so the the humans don't come in until the end of the story right and so it's kind of important because it shows that their view of the world and the universe doesn't hinge on the humans it hinges on Hmm. a larger plan yes absolutely so just from a narrative device that's very important to understand that right so the humans are going to come later not quite yet what's your name again i'm sorry Ready? Yeah. Gwen. Gwen, thank you. I should remember that. Good. You had your hand up. Yes. Um, I was just going to say that he seems to be a God who enjoys the act of creation, the way that he describes okay. everything in detail and goes in order, does it carefully, sees yeah. that it is good, calls it good. He seems to he enjoy likes what it. he's doing. Yeah, right. And, and he is calling it good, right? Absolutely. What, what's, he, what's he creating? I mean, we've got time and space here that he's creating, and he's doing it out of nothing. What else can we say about his creation that we've just read here, that Maggie's just read? What do we notice about it? Is it simple, even though it's ordered? It's incredibly complex. What do we find of what I mean, Why all this talk about a seed? What's the seed do? It ensures that creation will continue yeah. and not expire. Absolutely. Absolutely. So important. Right? Creation is within creation, is within creation, is within creation. So when God makes a living thing, the ability to propagate the living thing, whether it's a piece of grass, a plate of grass, or whether it's fish or fowl or human being, we all have the ability to replicate ourselves. It's not a one-time deal. God doesn't just say, okay, here I create, and then I'm going to keep creating and creating and creating. God creates, but within his creation are the seeds of life for forever. And think about that abundance when God does this. And here's where we can draw in some lessons, especially for those who've come from a, a Christian background. I mean, think about when, when Jesus makes the loaves and the, he replicates the loaves and the fishes. Right? He doesn't make exactly enough for everybody. He could have done that. I mean, he's Jesus. He could have, but it, it, they're, they're too many. Right? It's overflowing. And think about wedding at Cana where Jesus makes his first miracle and he makes wine. Right? They, they make it so high that the men can't move the urns because Jesus has filled it to the brim. Right? That's incredible. Nobody fills your wine to the brim because you have to transport these things. But yet, that's Jesus. Right? That's God. You never do anything halfway, ever. Right? And then, so we see that already as a major characteristic of this God, that he is good, he is ordered, but he is also a God of absolute life and abundance, right? always. And it perpetuates itself. So I, I want you to keep all of that in mind. This is important for us to understand, not just how the Hebrews see God, but how Western civilization, for the most part, will see God over time. Okay, anybody else have any other comments on this part? If not, we'll move on to the next. All right, who else would like to read? 
pick up where Manny, that'd be great, Gwen. Go ahead, just uh, start, and God said, let there be lights. Okay. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the cattle according to their kinds, and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Nice job, Gwen. And it was very good, right? So finally, it's not just good, it was very good. So let's, let's talk about this. What, what do we mean, let us make man in our image? What a complicated, let's, yeah, let's just talk about Maggie. Is he just referring to himself? Like as the okay, well, and, and from a Christian perspective, right, that's an absolutely good answer. That's a great answer. That we're thinking about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost here, right? That makes perfect sense. How would a Jew interpret this? Since we're thinking about the Hebrews here. Uh, yes, go ahead, Michaela. Sorry. It's setting man apart from the rest of the animals that God created because they're designed imitate their creator. Okay, all right. So how does that tell us about the hour then? Oh, I see what you're asking. No, that's um, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Remember, we're, we've got to be monotheists here. I have, this is one of the fundamental aspects of Judaism, that you have to be a monotheist. So could this R be, yeah, Tell me your name again. Anna. Anna, thank you. Could it be either the royal we or <laughs> it could um, be. he's including all the earth in the act of creation? Mm. Like he made man out of dust. So like man is the last thing he made. So everything in earth is being put into the final product. So maybe there, there are other sharers in creation in some way. Maybe. Sort of. Sort of. Okay. All right. What else? Gwen? Um, I was going to say maybe, um, I know later in the Gospels it says in the beginning it, it created through the Word, and that would be Jesus, but for the Jews that he hasn't come into play yet. So right. Could he maybe be speaking to the angels? Like okay, that and that, that's part of what I was trying to get at with Anna a little bit. It is possible he's talking to the angels, right, in our image. 
Uh, here's the word, and I'd like you all to know it. But the word that's used there in Hebrew is Elohim. And it, it means, it does mean the royal we. It means our court, the court of God. So I, honestly, I don't have an answer for this. It's just kind of fun to think about. There are probably 50 different ways to try and understand this, and I don't think anybody has the exact answer on it. But Elohim is important. So we know it's important, not necessarily because we know exactly why, but because there is this emphasis on the plurality there and community, something important. Again, I, I can't say exactly why, but it does seem to be to matter. So what does it mean to be made in God's image? What does that say about us? You sort of look back at everything that you've been told thus far in Genesis, and that you are good, that you are ordered, that you are Okay, a, or we should be. Or we should be. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Those are the things that we're meant to be. Okay. Seem pretty positive? Yeah. Ah, it seems really positive, right? We're made in God's image. I mean, how much better could it be? We're not going to be made gods, but we can be made in his image. We share in his grace. We share in his mercy. We share in his creativity. All of that. Somehow we have this pattern. In fact, God even says right after that, what's he tell this is men and women, right? Made in my image. What are they supposed to do now? Yeah, Michaela. Have dominion. Have dominion. What does that mean? To, he's, well, he says to fill the earth and subdue it. Okay. So they're supposed to basically be ambassadors for God on the earth. Okay, all right. Who has dominion in this classroom? <laughs> Maybe, right? We'll see. I'm supposed to, right? But what, what does it mean that I have dominion? It means I have to behave in a certain way. In other words, if I start behaving in a way that's not professorial, it throws the class into chaos because nobody knows their place at that point. And we get back to this idea of justice. So God, by giving dominion to man, is demanding that men and women behave in a certain way. They must behave in a certain way. Otherwise, it's chaos. You can't just hand over power to somebody without trusting that they will act according to what that power is. And so here we have that as well with God. So what all are they supposed to do? They're supposed to subdue the earth. Does that mean that we can just do whatever we want to the earth at any time? No, it means we have to behave responsibly, right? And I don't want to get too environmentalist in here. Uh, it's not the point. But it does mean that as a good steward, I would act as God would. It means that I do take care of the creatures. I do take care of the land. I don't just go nuke it and then start over again. Right? There's something we have to do that we do have some responsibility. In fact, I'd say we have a lot of responsibility to, to make this thing work. And so there's a lot of emphasis on responsibility that's given to the human being here as well. What's your name? Fiona. Fiona, thanks. Um, I did notice when we were reading through that... Um, there are some descriptions of what God's creating that we might think of automatically as like negative, like Such darkness as. or the sea monsters. Like oh, the word monster yeah, sounds right. like like you'd think of that automatically as something bad, but then he describes everything as very good. And so with kind of tying that back into the made in God's image, we are kind of like caretakers almost, but not made into other gods. We're made in his image, which means not exactly the same, which then kind of leads into us messing it up. <laughs> like Absolutely. He wouldn't. That's a hard balance to strike. Right? Really hard. Where we have the responsibility to act as God would, but we can never become God. Nor should we think we should ever become God. In some that that's a very hard thing to balance. And what is it that we have that the animals and the angels don't have? Reason. Well, we have reason, right? Very important. Reason is everywhere in this. We haven't talked about that yet. But there's definitely a reason here. What are the angels? They're spirits, right? What are the animals? They're beings of flesh. We're both. And so in the same way, Fiona, we're, we're thinking about we are to act as God would have us act without becoming God. We also have to balance what is both angelic and bestial at the same time. We're the only creature who has to do that. No other creature can. Right? 
we are the only ones. The angels don't have flesh, and the animals don't have souls. Not in the way we think of it. And so that means that somehow the human being is always, always a balancing act. And always, at so many levels. Yeah, Sam. Yeah, kind of in that same way, like a lot of different religions have the relationship between God and human as um, either accidental creation right. or that they um, right. resent each other. Yes. Like they go and they steal fire or whatever. Right. And they hate Absolutely. Each other. And this is. Which different. they're great stories. Right. Uh, but in, in this story, it's a lot different because yeah. it's God blessing the humans and giving them purpose. And it's kind of a partnership rather than a pest. Yes, beautifully stated. It is a partnership. And it has to be that way. Right? It absolutely has to be that way. But that means then that we have to behave in a certain fashion. Right? We can't just do what we want. Uh, and that, that's where it becomes very hard. We don't like that as humans. Okay, that's probably a great place to stop. Anybody have any final comments? We've still got a minute or two, but all right. It's good meeting you all. I can tell you like the class. <laughs> that means a lot. Thanks for, for putting so much into it. Thanks for those of you who read, those of you who talked. Thanks to all of you. But, uh, yeah, really appreciate it. So um, for Friday, finish Genesis. And I don't mean just Genesis 1 through 3, but I'd like you to read the next section as well, Covenant and Law. So uh, that's on page 23. And I also would like you to read Hammurabi. You don't have to read Hammurabi closely. But look through it. Uh, look at some of the laws that are there. But I do want you to read very closely everything that we have from Genesis. So, again, Genesis 1 through 3, and then Genesis 17. Oh, and then we get into Exodus a little bit, and Deuteronomy. So read that next section, Hebrews, Covenant, and Law. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Good meeting you. And I hope your first day of classes is everything you hoped it would be.